things about uh, our study last time uh, in Genesis that kind of need to be re reiterated in terms of why the flood. And, and I kind of titled the message The Great Flood. I could have titled it The Salvation of Noah. Certainly the, the emphasis seems to be, at least in quantity of text, describing the flood, building the ark, and so forth. But I think the takeaway for us is the fact that it's a story of salvation. It's a story of God saving Noah and his family out and away from his uh, judgment that was coming upon the earth. Uh, the other thing about the text that is uh, interesting, as I mentioned even in praying, it, it really is mocked and, uh, and ridiculed a lot. Some people will, uh, in teaching the flood of Noah, will actually not teach the text, but simply go through all of the scientific uh, evidence and apologetic for why it was a worldwide flood and how uh, all of these things are completely in, in the bounds of of uh, what's on the earth now and so forth. And in fact, the geological record testifies of a worldwide flood. I'm sure you get that all the time at school though. No, actually, yeah, this is one of those again where, where you don't, but uh, uh, I don't wanna spend the whole time on that, but we're gonna mention some of those and I'll, I'll go through a little bit from the uh, geological record as we kind of get to the end of the message. But the first thing to note is how bad the world was then we think it's pretty bad now. It is, but it's not as bad as it was then. Look at verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. We, we could say it, it is today. But notice the, uh, the qualifying statement. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You're saying, you just describe the neighbor of mine. Well, it could be true. It could be you might have a neighbor like this, but not every person on the earth is like this always evil continually all the time. We're kind of headed in that direction. Maybe we're not there yet, but that's the pre-flood assessment from God's perspective and why the judgment comes. Secondly, we mentioned the fact that the pre-flood culture had undergone a thorough demonization as we talked about the sons of God, again, cohabitating with the daughters of men, producing the Nephilim or the men of renown who were uh, large giant men who were incredibly violent and so forth. So there is a intent of every heart that's evil, a demonization of the world. That's the setting that Noah builds the, uh, the ark in. And uh, sometimes we certainly, for very good reason, see him as a hero of the faith and admire his faith and what it took to build the ark and preach for 100 years with no converts and so forth. But I don't think we understand the half of it uh, in terms of what it was really like for him uh, during those days. Just to make mention again of the literary style and may be meaningful to you, you could care less. It has no application other than to realize again who the writer is. Moses is the writer, a brilliant man with a tremendous education. And we see it over and over again in the literary style that he writes in. And uh, we've made mention of some of the characteristics, but we get another one here where he uses what's referred to as chiasmus, where he takes and builds events up and then does a mirror in, image of them going the other way. It's very well thought out. It's very intentional. Uh, uh, again, the, the apex is, uh, is uh, in chapter 8, verse uh, 1, where it says, And God remembered Noah. Next week we'll talk about what that means uh, and when it says he remembered him. But just to kind of point this out to you, Notice the, the, the uh, generations of Noah are given in verses 9 to 10 of chapter 6. And then, uh, the, again, it builds as an A, B, C, D, E. You have the title, and then it backs down the other way. Uh, I'll give you the uh, outline of uh, Alan Ross here. He said God's uh, A would be God resolves to destroy the corrupt race. And verses 11 to 13 of chapter 6. B, Noah builds an ark according to God's instructions. C, the Lord commands the remnant to enter the ark. The flood begins. D, E, the flood prevails and the mountains are covered. So uh, that's the stair stepping up. And then uh, F, God remembers Noah. And then you have the reverse going the other way. Instead of the flood prevailing, the flood recedes. Uh, the earth dries. God commands the remnant to leave. Noah builds an altar as opposed to building an ark. And the Lord resolves not to destroy humankind again. Uh, won't be on the test. Don't have to remember it. But just to point out again, uh, Noah, excuse me, Moses is taking a lot of care. 
when we talk about the inerrancy of Scripture, but just a lot of care in the literary style that he is uh, laying this out here. And uh, certainly, this becomes a huge theological account for us of Noah and the flood, because we'll see that he was, again, saved by grace, the same grace that saves us, uh, and what that really means. The other things that are here that are just uh, interesting for the if you're a, a Bible student, a Bible student, is there's a parallel that Moses draws between Noah and Adam. Now again, you have the creation account of Adam, and with Noah, you have decreation, the destruction, and a recreation. So they, they have a lot in common. As Kenneth Matthew, Matthew observes, uh, uh, Noah is depicted as an Adam revived. He is the sole survivor, successor to Adam. Uh, here's the things that are similar. Both are said to have walked with God. Both are the recipients of a promissory blessing. Both are caretakers of the lower creatures. Both father three sons. Both are workers of the soil. Both sin through the fruit of the tree. A sad episode in the life of both of them. And both father a wicked son who's under a curse. Very uh, interesting. There's also a parallel whether Moses intentionally saw it or not between himself and Noah. Uh, as uh, the word for ark is only found one other time in the Old Testament, and it's for that other little ark that a guy named Moses, who was a baby, was placed in that also had pitch on the inside and the outside and was floated down the Nile River for his survival and to be found eventually by one of the princesses of Pharaoh himself. So Noah went into an ark, but so did uh, Moses himself, a much smaller one, of course, both floods, both experienced a flood that preserved a people to serve God. You remember uh, Moses and the children of Israel going through the Red Sea and, of course, the great flood that collapsed then on Pharaoh uh, and his army. Both had explicit building instructions. One was for the ark, one was for the, the tabernacle, including the ark of the covenant. And uh, both were given specific uh, regulations in regards to clean and unclean animals. So uh, interesting, just the parallel, whether Moses realized it or not, between himself and Noah. Uh, again, we left off in verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And verse 9 continues the explanation. In the uh, first of the outline, we want to say the circumstances. Look at those that caused Noah's selection, verse 9 to 13. This is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So... The circumstance obviously include Noah and his relationship with God. Verse 9 says he was a just man, perfect in his generations. Uh, the idea of perfect is the idea of mature. It's not perfection, but uh, mature or complete in his faith. He, like his great-grandfather Enoch, walked with God. So he was mature in his faith. Uh, why is he the one to build the ark? Why didn't he, he and his family are saved? It was because uh, he found God's grace. He was mature in his faith, and he was submitted to God. And uh, that's the idea of walking with God. We talked about the fact if you're walking with somebody and they decide to go in a different direction, you have a choice to make. You can either continue to walk with them or not. And as we walk with God and he goes in a different direction than we want to go in, we don't get to say, how about junk in a pole? <laughs> no, we, we just got to determine if we're going to walk with God and he goes that way. Even if I want to go that way, I'm going to submit to him and walk with him. So again, Noah's life was submitted to God. And as I've mentioned, he's been saved by faith. Now I'm going to read from Hebrews 11:7, 7, the um, Hall of Fame of Faith that talks about uh, Noah in particular. And we're going to come back to it again. There's two things in this verse I want to emphasize that are important but first, again, just to read by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world. And uh, here's the emphasis I want to make right now. And became the heir of the righteousness 
which is according to faith. So he found grace in the eyes of God. How did he do that? He found grace through faith. As Paul would say, it is not of himself. It's not that of works that no one would boast. Noah was saved the same way that you and I are saved. In the same way as we continue in Genesis, we'll get to chapter 15 of Abraham, where it will say that he believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. The Old Testament saints were saved the same way, by God's grace through faith. Their relationship was certainly different. They didn't have near the promises. They didn't have the scriptures and so forth. They didn't have the Holy Spirit to permanently indwell them or anything. But it's very important that we see, even at this early stage of scripture, even prior to the flood, that people are saved by faith. Uh, very explicit here. If you've got the study notes, I've added lots of references for the Old Testament, including Psalm 32, and then all of the emphasis on the New Testament being saved by our faith in what God has done. Uh, the fourth thing about him, he's blameless in his generation. Now again, he's talking about his moral conduct. He wasn't a perfect guy by any means, but he lived in an incredibly depraved world, which leads to the second circumstance. Certainly his faith in his walk with God is important to note, but certainly the circumstances include the corruption of the earth. Again, verse 11, the earth was also corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with, with violence. So uh, the word uh, corrupt or corrupted, filled with violence, uh, used a couple of times. And uh, we mentioned last week the giants or the Nephilim, who were these uh, offspring, we might call them demonic aliens, that uh, are incredibly large and incredibly violent. And, uh, and basically, they're, they're the big bullies of the earth in doing anything they want. Corrupt means to decay, to ruin. It's the result of a decaying process. It's used in the Old Testament a few other times. It's used of Sodom and Gomorrah to talk about the sexual immorality. Uh, it's used in Deuteronomy 4 of a society that's given over to idolatry. And it's used by Daniel to describe a culture that, that is, uh, lives in falsehoods, lying in deceit. So all those things give us an indication of what the days of Noah were like. How bad was it that God has to destroy everybody on the planet except for one family? Pretty bad. Uh, it was pretty bad. And filled with violence, a term used of robbery, taking wives by force, and murder. So uh, a very corrupt place. So we look and the contrast is incredible when we think about it. Noah and his faith and what he lived with, what he endured. Oh, you don't know what it's like for me living the Christian life. Well, look at Noah. <laughs> Yeah, you might have a neighbor that's, that seems to you continually evil all the time. He lived in a world full of them. And besides that, he had these uh, weird demonic creatures running around uh, that uh, are calling the shots and, and ruining the world. It was a, it was a horrible place. Uh, so, uh, Shem, how many uh, believers have you got in your class at school? None. You know, I mean, you know, it's like, can you imagine these kids growing up and raising a family uh, in a world like that. Uh, you're thinking, I think we're close. Yeah, but it's, it's not as bad. Uh, and certainly, we can learn from Noah. So circumstances uh, are important. And then the command to build the ark, verses 14 to 16. Make yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and outside with pitch. And this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be three cubics, 300 cubics, excuse me. It's with 50 cubics. It's height 30 cubics. You shall make a window for the ark, and you shall finish it to a cubic from above, and set the door of the ark in its side. You shall have with, make with it lower, second, and third deck. So uh, the command includes some very specific things uh, about the ark. And just to mention three of them. The first is the uh, incredible size. Now, in terms of a cubic, uh, we know what a Babylonian cubic, an Egyptian <clears throat> Hebrew, and they all varied a little. Some had a short cubic, some had a long. But basically, the average is about 18 inches. So if we go with, with that, then the ark was 450 feet long. So that's a, a football field and a half. So if you think of Aloha Stadium and that football field, and then ha add half that again, that's the length uh, of the ark. We're talking a very big boat. Uh, 75 feet wide, 
45 feet tall. So four and a, a four and a half story building would be uh, the, uh, how tall the ark was. Three decks, therefore it had 95,700 square feet of deck space. It had a million 396,000 cubic feet in a gross tonnage of 13,960 feet. Now the largest wooden boat that uh, has ever been built uh, in recent uh, history was the Cuddy Sark. It was uh, 212 feet, so the ark is 238 feet longer. Very, uh, very large. To put it in a, another comparison, uh, a Nimitz class aircraft carrier is about a little more than twice the length of the ark. That's still a pretty good sized boat if you've ever seen, seen an aircraft carrier. Uh, engineers have done a couple of studies that are interesting, and one of them is to build the ark according to this dimension uh, and then a, a scale model of it, <coughs> put it in a pool by which they can replicate the cataclysmic uh, events that would have gone on. And again, part of the criticism against the ark, scientists would say in the idea of a worldwide flood, is that if you took all of the moisture in the air on the earth at this time and brought it all down, it would come up to about an inch and a half. So how do you get a worldwide flood out of that? But uh, all they're thinking about is rain for 40 days and 40 nights. But what the Bible describes is a cataclysmic event whereby uh, the ground and volcanic eruptions are happening uh, under the ocean. Under undersea caverns are opened up. The heavens are, are dropping. Uh, incredible amounts of, uh, of water because there has been no rain up to, uh, up to this point. So it's a huge uh, event that's taking place and, and putting this replica in the ark, uh, they found it impossible to sink it. It was, it was so built and so structured that, and again, the more weight that you put on it, the more stable it would actually become. The other thing another engineer did that was interesting as we think about Noah and his four sons building this thing is uh, how long it would take to build. Well, one engineer estimated if they only worked the four guys, six with average carpenter skills, if they worked only six to eight hours a day, they built it in 81 years. So they had more than enough time to complete the task. The second thing about the ark, not only its incredible size, it was to be covered on the inside and out, verse 14, covered on the inside and out with pitch. Now this is only, it becomes interesting and we understand the idea that this asphalt-like pitch that they used would water seal the thing inside and out, uh, preserve the wood and so forth. But it's the same word that's used in Leviticus 17.11 for atonement. So it makes it kind of interesting. There again, Moses, our same writer says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it to you upon the altar to make, that's our word, atonement or pitch for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. The thing that saves on the altar, the atonement, is described here as the thing that would save uh, Noah and his family. Of course, uh, we're also including God's supernatural intervention. We'll talk about that a bit as we go. The third thing is the ark had a very specific de uh, design. Notice the uh, windows for ventilation, uh, 18 inches from uh, the top. And uh, we think about the technology and the skill developed by Cain and his descendants. Uh, it's not any stretch of the imagination to picture Noah being able to accomplish this, but still an incredible act of, uh, of faith more than great carpentry skills. So the circumstances were uh, very interesting, a contrast between his life and those around him, the command to build, uh, but with it, there's a covenant that's given, and that's verses 17 to 22. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall go into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. And of everything, of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female, of the birds after their kind, of animals after their kind, and of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind. I know some of you are thinking, why don't you leave the creeping things off? <laughs> two of every, uh, every kind will come to you uh, to keep them alive. And you shall take for yourself all food that is eaten, 
and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Thus Noah did, according to all God commanded him, so he did. So the covenant here, this promise from God, and we've already seen a covenant with Adam in terms of the promise of the Messiah coming through the seed of the woman in Genesis 3.15. This is the second covenant of the Bible, and uh, as we go along, we'll get more information about it. But certainly what it does is it promises, uh, and uh, under the covenant, uh, safety and security. And uh, there would be times certainly when Noah would be uh, in that ark with his family, being tossed around uh, in the upheaval of the oceans collapsing and so forth, that um, I bet he was just kind of really hanging on to that. <laughs> but God, you said, you know. And, uh, and there are times when we go through difficult experiences in life when that is what we rely on. It has been the sustenance of God's word that has kept God's people in crisis for centuries, and we see it here with, with Noah. The second thing about the covenant, it required Noah's uh, obedience. Now, with the Abrahamic covenant, nothing was required on behalf of, of Abraham. God just says, I'm making a covenant. There's nothing required on your behalf. It's everlasting and it's eternal. It's still in effect. Uh, bless those that bless you. Curse those that curse you. Through you, I'm going to bring a blessing to the whole world, which would be the Messiah, of course. But here, there's something required of, of Noah. It's a conditional covenant. It was required uh, his obedience. And we see that recorded several times. In chapter 7, verse 5, it says, And Noah did, according to all that the Lord commanded him. Verse 9, Two by two they went into the, uh, uh, went into the ark to Noah, male and female, as God had commanded Noah. Verse 16, So those that entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him. So Noah's life was really a... Tremendous life of uh, obedience, and uh, it was part of the covenant. He would be protected and be kept safe. Uh, and then the obedience, as we mentioned, was in the midst of uh, extreme circumstances. Somebody, Bill, was reminding me, and, and I haven't heard it in a long time, the whole Bill Cosby, you know, Noah building the ark and, and everything. So what's that? You know, and, but you can imagine as he lays out the keel, and it goes 450 feet long, What's that? You know, and he has to try to explain. And then the ribs, you know, this is all taking a couple of decades later, you know, it's starting to take shape. And um, uh, the ridicule, of course, and the mocking and the jokes we're, we're kind of familiar with. I mean, how many Noah jokes can you tell in 100 years? You know, there had to be a few. But, but really think about the reality in terms of especially these demonic creatures who understand the concept of a coming judgment that is a lot being laid against them because of what they've done and who they are. Do you think they may have gone up and said, kind of wish you wouldn't do that? Or do you think they went up and said, if you continue, I'll kill you and all your family and burn this thing to the ground. I'm coming back tomorrow. That's more likely what they said every day. And maybe the numbers of them grew. I want to suggest the only way he does this is by God's supernatural protection against them. It was a horrific circumstance under which he built it. It's kind of, you know, it hasn't rained and all that. We can do the Bill Cosby lines, and there was probably some of that mocking. The mocking was nothing compared to the threats that came against him uh, on a regular basis. And the same thing happens today. You step out to do something courageous for God, the threats will come. The things will come. The fear will be there. Things will happen. The demonic entities that were there and present John says the spirit of the Antichrist is already in the world, and there will be things that come against you. Um, sometimes we, we don't know if we're even doing any good for God if there's, there's no, no resistance. I remember when uh, C. Everett Koop became the uh, Surgeon General for the United States, a very uh, godly man, and uh, he was being interviewed, and, uh, and uh, the, they were asking him, how do you think you're doing after your first couple of years in office and everything? Uh, and he says, well... I'm not being criticized by the conservatives on the right, and uh, I'm not being uh, criticized by the, the liberals on the left. So I've got a feeling I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> I mean, if there's no resistance, uh, is there really something good taking place for the kingdom of God? Noah lived in, in uh, incredible times, and, uh, and that leads to the third thing we want to point out about his obedience. It would absolutely require God's enabling. 
Now, we're going to see it specifically. Again, the mockers would say, how would Noah get all of those birds and all of those animals onto the ark? And the answer is he did not. He did not. He simply walked in, and God brought them supernaturally. And God would have had to intervene supernaturally and put it in the heart and the mind of animals to walk onto this thing two by two. It would be virtually impossible for Noah and his four sons to round up approximately 21,000 pairs of animals and get them on, on, on board. It's just plus change the birds down. Uh, God's supernatural intervention was required. But as we say, where God guides, God provides. You know, where he calls, he then enab enables us to do that. And it's so important to remember that because sometimes God is asking us to do something that we just don't have it in us to do. And there's where the faith comes in, where we go ahead and do it, just trusting that God is going to bring the enabling. And I always think of the story <clears throat> of Jesus in the synagogue there in Capernaum, right off the Sea of, uh, uh, of Galilee, and uh, going in where he would minister on a regular basis. And you remember the story, the man with the withered hand. And even the enemies of Jesus knew that his attention would be drawn to the man who was in the greatest need. Even his enemies knew that. That guy is hurting and he's in trouble and there's something wrong with him. Watch Jesus. He'll go right to him when he comes in here. And sure enough, he does. And he tells the man to stretch out your withered hand. And of course, God then enables him to be able to do that by supernatural intervention. And that's what we have in the story of Noah, certainly, but that's what we need to count on in our lives. When God calls us to build an ark or whatever it might be, he calls us to, to build. But uh, he requires, he enables, uh, to, but uh, he still had to do his part, take every kind of food. And of course, Noah did everything in complete obedience. I kind of love this uh, line from Kent Hughes, and it's kind of an extended quote, but he says, uh, the words uh, everything and all describe Noah's obedience. So now we begin to see what it means to be righteous. The righteous person rests everything on the bare word of God and obeys it. We also glimpse what it means to walk with God because to walk with him is not a stroll. It means to go in the same way in obedience even as the culture marches the other way. What is a person God saves like? He believes in God's promise to him, and it is counted as righteousness. And as a righteous man, he lives not a perfect, but a blameless life. He walks with God, and everything about him is covered by obedience to God's perfect word. Pretty good definition of a Christian there. As we look to the Lord, our faith is accounted to him as righteous. We determine to walk with God in submission to him. What is a, a person like that God saves, believes in God's promise to him, and therefore accounted as righteous? So covenant, so important, following the command and the radical circumstances of his life. Notice fourth, as we get to chapter 7, the first 16 verses, the completion of the ark was certainly timely. Then the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female, also seven each of birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the face of all the earth. For after seven more days, I will cause it to rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights, and I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. Noah was 600 years old when the flood waters were on the earth. So Noah, with his sons, his wife, and his sons' wives, went into the ark because of the waters of the flood. Of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds and everything that creeps on the earth, two by two they went into the ark to Noah, male and female as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain on the earth 40 days and 40 nights. On the very same day, Noah and, his, and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons were with them, entered the ark. 
They and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah, two by two, of all flesh in which is the breath of life. So those who entered, male and female of all flesh, went in as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. So the ark was completed. It was time to, uh, uh, to enter, which kind of comes again to this idea of uh, was there room for the animals? Well, we've already talked about the, uh, the cubic feet, the tonnage, the three decks, and, uh, and so forth. Uh, and all that to say, certainly there would be room for all the animals. Now, <clears throat> notice it keeps saying after its own kind. So it could be that Noah took on the ark not every species of dogs, not every species of cat, but just the ones that could replicate later and have the genetic makeup to produce all of the dogs that would later come. Or he could simply have taken all the ones that were there. Uh, at least by estimates today, uh, all of the uh, animals that are uh, basically on the planet uh, are a very large number, but if you reduce it to the ones that would have gone on the ark, which are the ones that could not survive in, uh, in water, in the, in the very famous uh, Scopes trial, uh, Clarence Darrell asked uh, William Jennings Bryan if the fish survived the, the flood. He didn't have an answer. Come on, where'd you get your law degree? Read the Bible. Unfortunately, he's one of my namesakes, but, uh, uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, no, he, the things that survived in the water would survive. It was just those that had the breath uh, in their nostrils. The uh, scripture is very clear. If he took the animals that are on the earth today, they would come up to 3,700 mammals, 8,600 birds, 6,300 reptiles, 2,500 amphibians, which would be 21,100. And uh, yes, with as big as the ark was, there would have been room for all the animals and a couple of basketball courts and a couple of tennis courts and some handball courts and, and lots of other room. There would have been plenty of room for them and all the food, everything that was necessary. In terms of the food supplies, they could have eaten the whole time or it could be that like lots of large mammals, they would have hibernated under those conditions during that time. Uh, many animals have been known to hibernate for uh, a year at a time under similar moist, wet, dark conditions. So uh, plenty of room for the animals on the ark. Uh, secondly, in terms of completing the ark, it's for the purpose very uh, explicitly of escaping the coming judgment. Notice Noah and his family enter the ark. Uh, the rains do not begin for another seven days. Uh, interesting, according to Jewish sources, the Jewish Midrash says it was a period of mourning for Methuselah. Now remember, Methuselah dies and then the flood comes. So uh, very, very interesting. We'll talk about the uh, that a little more when we come to the encouragement that uh, he would have received from these tremendous men and women of God that were part of his own family. Let's go back to Hebrews 11:7. 7. I want to point out one other aspect of that verse in the New Testament. Again, reading by faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, and notice this, by which he condemned the world. How did Noah condemn the world? Because he entered the ark. No one could say, I didn't know. I wasn't aware. I didn't know there was a God. I didn't know I was to worship God. I didn't know that there was a coming judgment because they knew because Noah built it and he entered. Now, if you're in a, in a classroom situation and you take a test and everybody in the class all gets an F, you could say, that's not a very good teacher. <laughs> He's not a very good communicator. Uh, there could be a lot of complaining, saying, ah, that's not really fair. You didn't even cover that. How are we supposed to know that? That's the kind of things that I would say. Maybe you never said that, but I, I would say things like that all the time. But I always hated that one guy, that one guy that would get an A. Everybody gets an F. The one guy gets an A. What is he doing? He's condemning the rest of us. See, because he got an A, and then the rest of us could say, you didn't cover it. I didn't know. Because the teacher would go, what do you mean? How'd that guy get an A? See, Noah entering the ark condemns, the Bible says, the rest of the world because nobody could say, I didn't know. Because Noah did know a preacher of righteousness for 100 years. 
explicitly warning of the coming judgment. Again, according to Matthew 24 and also 2 Peter. What kept Noah going during this time?